Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you. Look at your local communities in a new light. Discover the unexpected history in your own backyard. Meet the extraordinary Evansville soldier whose sacrifice became a symbol of the American war effort. Travel to Rockville, Indiana, to where visitors spend their free time behind bars. Journey back to the West Baden Hotel, when big wigs mixed with the big top. And welcome country rock band Split Rail to the studio. You never know what hidden history we'll explore. So stay tuned for this episode of The Weekly Special. Welcome to the Weekly Special. I'm Erica Sagone. And I'm Daryl Neer. Erica, one of the reasons I enjoy being part of the Weekly Special is that no matter where we go in the state, we find some unexpected piece of history. It's true. And like us, you probably spot an old building or a plaque with a name on it, and you know there's got to be a story behind it. And tonight, we're going to dig into a few of those stories. For example, one story begins when President Wilson sent troops to World War I, and one of the first Americans to join the battle was Corporal James Bethel Gresham from Evansville, Indiana. In November 1917, amid the bloodiest fighting of World War I, the field commander of France's 18th Division, P.E. Bordeaux, gathered members of his regiment to pay respects to three fallen soldiers. They were the first Americans to die in combat during the Great War. Among them was Corporal James Bethel Gresham from Evansville, Indiana. These American graves, noted Bordeaux, represent the ultimate sacrifice for the liberty of all nations, the most noble of causes. James Bethel Gresham was a child when his family moved from a one-room log cabin in Kentucky to Evansville near the turn of the century. When he was a youngster, his father died, leaving the family nearly penniless. Bethel, as he was known, left school after the fourth grade and went to work at various jobs to support his mother and three younger siblings. He only drives horses at one point, which he evidently enjoys, uh, handling a horse team. He'll work in a uh, local furniture factory for a period of time, uh, trying to earn money. By 1914, he is going to join uh, the, the U.S. Army. And then throughout his Army career, He's going to see that away as helping support his struggling family. By the spring of 1917, when President Wilson announced America's entry into the Great War, the battle had been raging in Europe for three years. That summer, Gresham and thousands of other raw American troops were training to fight a seasoned German army in the Lorraine region of France. During this training, Gresham met fellow Midwestern recruits Tom Enright of Pittsburgh and Merle Hay from Glidden, Iowa. During World War I, the fighting that's going to be occurring is going to be very brutal. It's, it's going to, particularly on the Western Front, uh, break down into trench warfare. Basically, life month after month, living in these earthen trenches, open trenches of water, of lice, of rats, of uh, just freezing conditions in the winter and uh, sun-baked conditions in the summer. In the winter of 1917, with little training in trench warfare, the American troops were sent into a rain-soaked region known as No Man's Land to serve alongside their French allies. On November 3rd, Gresham, Enright, and Hay were stationed in a trench near the German front at 3.30 in the morning, a group of soldiers emerged from the shadows. Assuming they were French, Gresham hollered, Don't shoot, we're Americans. 
That was all the German troops needed to hear. Gresham was shot and killed. The following day, French soldiers returned to the battle site and discovered Gresham's body, along with those of Enright and Hay, who had been riddled with bullet holes and bayonet wounds. These were reported to be the first American soldiers to lose their lives in combat during World War I. The French are very mindful of this, and the French are thankful the Americans are there. Uh, and General Bordeaux of France, the next day when they are buried, he certainly commends their service and recognizes their service, and they're buried there uh, in the Lorraine region of France. News swiftly reached Evansville and the rest of the United States, shocking the nation. The distant war had come home to Indiana. For months, images of the three fallen soldiers were used to symbolize American sacrifice during the struggle for freedom. Their images appeared on war bond posters and their names in folk songs. Several years after the war, the bodies of the three soldiers were exhumed and returned to their hometowns. In the summer of 1921, with somber and dignified ceremony, Gresham's body was buried at Locust Hills Cemetery in Evansville. To further honor Gresham, the town raised enough money to build a new home for his mother. That home still stands today. Appropriately enough, it serves as transitional housing to help Hoosier veterans reintegrate into society after their service to the country is over. I think Gress represents the willingness to sacrifice yourself for the greater cause. He represented the sacrifice that Americans were willing to make. And I think that idea of freedom and, and the willingness to defend that certainly was what he represented. <laughs> The Evansville Museum of Arts, History, and Science has more information about this Hoosier war hero. Learn more at emuseum.org. Now, Erica, this is certainly a somber story, but it certainly humanizes and puts a face on an otherwise horrific war. And it is touching to see how his legacy lives on in his hometown uh, with the transitional house. It's just wonderful. Well, for the past decade, a bed and breakfast in Rockville, Indiana, has gained worldwide attention for its unique history. Spending a night behind bars isn't usually bucket list material. But here's something that might change your mind. Old Jail Inn in Rockville. What was the real Park County Jail from 1879 to 1998 is now a place where people willingly and comfortably stay the night. At Old Jail Inn, the guest rooms are the original cells behind barred doors. The lockdown panel, the sally port, and the drunk tank are all intact. People love staying in the jail because the experience is like no other. I think you get that, ooh, I'm staying where someone bad stayed. And I think what happens is it fulfills that thrill. Check, I stayed in a jail. So people love to see the things that are here, like the plates that they ate on and the uh, clothes that they left. I get a lot of people who like history. The kind of people that I get are more adventurous, do not want the norm. They want that unusual experience. I have nine cells. <laughs> we don't call them rooms here, we call them cells. <laughs> Five small cells share a common bathroom. Two larger cells, formerly the booking cells, share another bathroom. Then there's murderer's row with two more cells. Each cell has a door that locks and either curtains or an additional door for privacy. Deborah says she can have fun with the theme, but that she has to take other amenities seriously. First of all, it has to be clean. Then it has to have really good water pressure. And all this concrete and granite and steel and marble, I can give you a bed that is so comfy. You have to come in and feel good. You have to be welcomed. And you have to know that this is an experience. A wine bar called The Drunk Tank gives guests a peek at the jail's original drunk tank in the basement. With an eerie passageway leading to solitary confinement, and a tunnel to the courthouse. So how did this building go from a jail to an inn? In 2009, on a visit to Rockville, 
Deborah went to the jail on a whim. A lady that was here in town that ran the Visitor's Bureau said to me in gist, she said, you know, you're kind of different. You should go down and see this property we have. It's right on the square. And I said, well, what is it? And she said, oh, it's the old jail. And I go, pooh, I've never been in a jail in my life. I walked 10 foot in and I even leaned forward and went, oh, <laughs> never in a million years. And when I turned, because I was like, oh, I'm out of here, this, is, this would never be for me. I wasn't even looking for a building. I turned and all of a sudden is this door. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna buy that. It was a round top steel gate from 1879 that led to the jail's drunk tank, plus a matching door and two windows. Deborah envisioned them for her own home back in Illinois. So I went back to the Visitor's Bureau and I said, yeah, I'm just not a jail person, but I wrote a check and she said, come back and see me in three days. When I came back and I'm like, okay, I'm here to collect the doors, you know, and she goes, and here's the deed. We decided you can just have the whole thing. The whole thing, the entire decaying jail. I really can't say the words, but I'll tell you, it was terrible. The stench was really bad, and it, it was filthy. It, and it had clothes and paperwork and everything. It was just like someone walked out of the middle of their day and left everything behind. Deborah thought she would find someone to take the building off her hands, but then she got an idea. I walked out of this cell, and all of a sudden I thought, as a kid, I'd come here to the Covered Bridge Festival. They have a lot of tourists here. This would be a bed and breakfast. Deborah says the barred doors and granite and marble cell walls couldn't be moved or removed. And so she embraced the jail theme, the floor plan, and its features. After four months of intense cleanup and 380 gallons of fresh paint, the jail opened in 2010. The inn's busiest time is during Park County's infamous Covered Bridge Festival in October. Deborah says the inn books up three years in advance. Year-round, she sees honeymooners, bachelorette parties, family reunions, girlfriend getaways, all who leave their stories not in a guest book, but right on the walls. Some people would come and honestly say to me, oh my, this is a jail. Like they were telling me for the first time in this project after a year that I lived in jail. And I go, yes, that's why I named it Old Jail Inn. You just have to know that, um, no, it's not the Hilton, but it's, uh, it's sure something that you'll never forget. For hours and directions or to make a reservation for your jail stay, visit oldjailin.com. Well, Daryl, what do you think? Would you stay at the old jail inn? Erica, dare I say, I've, and knock on wood, I think that's the only way I would go to a jail and <laughs> stay in jail. Hopefully. Now, old jail inn is not the only lodging in Indiana with strange history. One of the state's grandest hotels once hosted the greatest show on earth. The historic atrium at the West Baden Springs Hotel has hosted glamorous celebrities and exotic guests, but none more exotic than the circus. Oh, the circus history of the area is so interesting. And it's very hidden right now. Ed Ballard was the man who controlled the gaming in the valley. And he was a very shrewd business person. He owned a lot of property, and at any given time, he was worth between 20 and 100 million dollars, which is a staggering sum back then. He made great investments. One of the investments was a circus. As a small boy, he was so poor that he couldn't even afford to go to the circus. But he had the opportunity in 1913 to buy one. In Peru, Indiana, there was a circus called the Hagenbeck Wallace Circus. It was started by a man named Ben Wallace. Later on, he joined with Carl Hagenbeck, who was an animal trainer from Germany. And the circus had people acts and animal acts. In 1913, there was a horrible flood. The Mississippi River and the Wabash flooded, and the circus grounds were so flooded that even elephants drowned. It decimated the circus. Well, Ed Ballard stepped in about that time and probably made a good business deal and bought that circus. His idea was, I'm bringing it down to French Lick and we're going to have it winter here. By 1915, he had buildings built 
just almost in the front yard of his house. He wanted to be able to walk out his front door, go right to the circus ground, see the animals and the, everything that he couldn't do when he was a boy. There are a few old timers here who still remember elephants walking down the street. The first time the circus was in town, Lee Sinclair let them set the circus tents up on the old golf course, which is just right by the arches that enter in. During World War I, however, when this was an army hospital at West Baden, uh, they did have a performance inside the atrium. They would do a dress rehearsal performance in April for the community, hop on a train, and you would not see them again until the first week of November. And these circuses traveled by rail which meant they could do a town a day, and that's exactly what they did. They moved every single day. Day and night, the circus moved like an efficient military unit along the rail lines, until a tragic night in 1918. An exhausted train engineer fell asleep in transit, ramming his locomotive into the back of the circus train. An estimated 80 people were killed, and 120 injured in total, nearly half of the troop. That today is known in circus circles as the great train wreck. You say those three words, everybody knows what you mean. And it still is the largest loss of circus life of any accident for any circus going. That caused Ed Ballard to ante up something like $300,000 to help take care of things. And no different from today, yes, there were little lawsuits, all sorts of things like that happened. But the real devastation was, how does this circus continue on? Within three days after the accident, they did perform again in Beloit, Wisconsin, and other circuses sent people to help. That, that's what made the difference. The circus did bounce back. In the 1920s, the circus experienced a golden age, and within the decade, Ballard and his partners owned every single American circus but one, Ringling Brothers. In 1929, they thought, well, we own five circuses. Let's see if we can buy Ringling. The three partners sat with John Ringling. Two of the partners wanted to buy, the other one didn't. But there was a discussion, and the upshot of the deal was the gentleman sold out to the Ringling Circus for, I've read 1.7 million, I've read as high as 2 million. In 1929, six weeks later, the stock market crashes. Ballard was an extremely lucky business person that way. Once the circus sold to Ringling, it was the end of circus here. And that's today why you know Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey Circus and you have never heard of Hagen Beck Wallace. Had that deal gone the other way, the words Ringling Brothers wouldn't mean anything. French Lick's circus history has been kept alive at the French Lick West Baden Museum. Learn more at flwbmuseum.com. Well, Daryl, the actual circus is obviously gone, but at the museum, they have a diorama of the Hagenbeck Wallace um, Circus. It's one of the largest circus dioramas in the world. And wow. it took, I think, 40 years to complete. Oh, amazing. amazing. Well, we are excited to welcome our next musical guests, hailing from Morgan County, meet Split Rail. Far back as I can remember, I've had a love for music. My parents got me guitar lessons around 10 or 12 years old. When I first started taking music real seriously, I was probably 15, 16 years old. Well, Ryan and Steve were in a band when they were 13, 14 years old. I knew Ryan's girlfriend at the time, wife now. She kind of told him about me and told me about them. And I had a jam spot, so they came over. And been friends ever since. Well, I've been in and out of bands over the last 10 years playing everything from blues to heavy metal and kind of seen there was starting to be a market in the bars for a little bit different kind of you know country music well my drummer nick he and i had been jamming for a few months and had tried a few different guys out it just all came together one day i told him i knew a few guys and thought they might be interested and finally drug them out to the jam room and the rest was history so I'd say a lot of people would describe us as a heavier side of Americana or country with the kick of a hammer. Rock and hillbilly country, I guess, if you will. We're just different. We're just, we're just split rail. We all write songs in the band and that gives us a unique sound from one song to the next. 
we all grew up listening to a wide variety of music, everything from traditional old school country, Waylon and Hank, all the way to Pantera and Slayer and death metal. A lot of that comes out in our original music. There's also meaning and soul in every song. Nothing generic about our music. We just kind of play what we feel. We're not trying to fit into a box. We're not trying to be a radio band. We're making music that we believe in and can be proud of, and hopefully it does relate to our fans and the people that come out and support us every week. We started out trying to be able to go out and bring a crowd to the bars, because really around here, that's what you got to do. Just last year, we decided it was time to maybe take it serious, get in the studio, and we just put out a 14-song EP, all original music. We couldn't be happier with how it turned out in the end, and we're real excited about it. We're wanting to get that album heard, get them original songs heard, and maybe try to widen that fan base and spread that fire that we got burning pretty good here in our hometown, but just trying to get out there and get it heard. I guess the reason we keep plugging away at it is because maybe we got something to say. There's maybe just the reason I picked up that guitar 20 years ago. It's that adrenaline rush when you take the stage and something I can't imagine not doing right now. When we take the stage, we try to give our all, and it's definitely the one place I don't think about anything else. It's all about me, my guitar, and my brothers up there, and we're just doing our thing, just giving it everything we got. I'm not worried about work. I'm not worried about bills. I'm just thinking about the music and the moment, just being in the moment. And now, Split Rail. Long wicky when they come and get me out, just buckle my boots, be out of my way for the sun can see. I'll be alone with the breeze and these, the rest of the souls I call my friends. Well, I see the road to ride, I got some pain. I'm a book for oh, it lets me in I won't be back again I'll be good for oh, the story is told this time Oh yeah I won't be lost a fair way Oh yeah And that's where I belong
Split Rail just released their debut album. Find out all the latest information at their website, splitrailband.com. Well, Erica, that's all the time we have tonight. Yep, Split Rail will take us out. Good night. Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you.